When visiting the capital wasteland, it was made quite clear that this part of America wasn't doing so well. Debris littered the land. Inner city buildings were totally uninhabitable. Super mutants roamed the land, capturing people who were just trying to survive, and food and water was extremely limited. Whilst the residents of the capital wasteland were eventually given clean water, thanks to the clean water project named Project Purity, originally set up by James and his wife, this would not be the end of their troubles, and war still raged on between the factions that looked to set up their bases within this area. However, whilst all might have looked bad within this grand city, heading out further west, one city was doing even worse, with almost all of its inhabitants being wiped out due to wars, diseases, and on top of that, were also ruled by a group of raiders. This area would be known as the Pit, and as the Lone Wanderer ventured into this area, they would go on to witness what had happened to this once great city, what had happened to its inhabitants, and what they were also going through at that point in time. So what did happen within the pit? Why are there creatures known as trogs littered about in the areas? Who rules this city? And what has been its history up until this point? Well, in today's video, we will be exploring the story of the area known as the pit, as well as where it stands right now. This is the story behind the Raider Run City known as the pit from the Fallout universe. Pitt was originally the great city of Pittsburgh within the state of Pennsylvania. This city was specifically known for being one of the largest industrial centers within America, and inside its city walls would be grand factories that would conduct the production of steel. As the Great War started merging its head and America started to go to war against the Chinese, Pittsburgh would become one of the Chinese priority targets, because without it, America's production would slow down dramatically and would massively hinder their war effort. As the bombs fell down onto and around the Pittsburgh area, it would dramatically change the environment of the land around the city with mass radiation spilling all throughout the water supplies and the nearby vegetation. This was also not helped due to the amount of pollution the factories would pump into the area. With the radiation mixing with the smoke and other chemicals coming out of the factories, the environment became extremely hazardous and unlike anything anyone had seen before, making Pittsburgh's air quality extremely unique unique, but not in a good way. One positive could be taken from these bombings from China, and that was that the bombs had provided more room as well as raw materials to enhance the city's construction. This was also helped due to the fact that there was a nearby water supply thanks to the river that was located right next to the city, meaning that whilst they were a main target in the war, they were still able to continue construction and had more room now to expand upon their goals. But there was a problem which the citizens of the city didn't know about, and that was that the water was heavily polluted with not only radioactive material but mutagenic agents and dangerous carcinogens. Eventually the destruction of the world came as the bombs fell in 2077 and after that the area of Pittsburgh as well as many others would never be the same again. After this event the city of Pittsburgh fell completely into chaos as it was taken over by various raider gangs making sure they established themselves all throughout the city to make the most of its resources and structures. With these new raider gangs turning up to take over the city, they would start going on to build the city up once again and begin the construction of their new city that they would label as the Pit. As this was decided, the raiders would start conscripting and enslaving workers from the nearby area where the Ohio River diverges. By 2103, this operation was in full swing with the leaders of the raider group utilizing enforcers to enslave and then watch over them as they worked on their construction of their new settlement. These events of course would have driven some of the workers to hit back against their captors and try and escape, not only because they were being heavily mistreated but also because the radiation was tearing into them with their nearby water resources all being so toxic. With this one individual named Paige formed a group of enslaved locals and desperately tried to escape their captivity. And on top of this, multiple US soldiers including Captain Oliver Fields, Sergeant Fred Redcliffe and Sergeant Thompson 
launched a mission to liberate the enslaved citizens within the pit and save them from the raiders. But unfortunately, this mission was to be a failure, with many of the soldiers and civilians being severely wounded in the process. But despite this effort from the military personnel, the civilians led by Page were able to flee the settlement of the pit and became the settlers within Appalachia, gathering more and more survivors along the way, promising a chance at rebuilding a new safe world once again, free from raiders and slavers. Eventually forming their own settlement they would label as Foundation within the Savage Divide in that same year. But sadly for these settlers, news about the pit continued to pass down as it became the scene of a new bitter conflict between two factions trying desperately to gain overall control of it. These two factions would be the industrious survivors organizing themselves into the Union against the vicious raiders who would go on to call themselves the Fanatics. One other group was brought into the war who were used to fight back against the Fanatics as well, these being the Hellcat Company. This war went on for some time and only really came to a head when the Vault Dwellers of Vault 76 from Appalachia found themselves involved within the war and would help solve the problems of the area. Whilst it is not known yet what happened within this battle between all of the factions on the writing of this, it is known that despite all of their efforts, the pits would never truly be saved. And even if the good intentioned people of Appalachia helped set it up to welcome people in, it would eventually go back to the way it was before as humanity went into the 23rd century. Life continued on after the events of 2103, and humanity within the pit tried desperately to rebuild their population, but a new problem arose for them. It seemed as though every child that was born within this time was being brought into this world with horrific deformities, like cancerous growths or vestigial limbs. But not only this, as time continued on, almost the whole population became afflicted with genetic diseases and mutations, all due to the radiated water of the rivers surrounding their settlements. The residents of the pit were concerned by these mutations as anyone would be and tried to work out how to cure them. But something worse was happening to a few of the survivors here. Throughout their population was one genetic disease that was hitting a few randomly. This disease would go on to cause neurological problems for those that had it and very quickly would turn into extremely violent individuals, easily frustrated and eventually would turn into primitive beings. Those who were seen to be becoming one of these creatures would be put aside and would be labelled as wild men, who would go on to roam in packs just outside and within the city and take out anyone in their way. The only people they wouldn't attack would be their own kind of other wild men. But an even worse conditions seemed to threaten the people of the pit that was even more terrifying than the wild man disease. This disease would be labelled as the troglodyte degeneration contagion, also known as TDC. And if anyone got this disease, they would transform into something horrifying. Their posture would be turned into hunchback form. Their aggression was set at an all-time high, and they would become feral in nature. Seeing this happen to their community, the people of the pit would label these newly formed creatures as troglodytes. This was particularly bad as the ones most affected by this disease would be newborn infants, meaning the population of the pits were having serious issues as most of their children were turning into these terrifying creatures of the trogs. As the people of the pit continued on, their population would continue to dwindle as no one seemed to be able to give birth to healthy children. This in part affected the city's raider leaders, meaning they were now not really in control of the pit anymore and were open to attacks from anyone looking to take it over. Now with this in full effect, warring tribes of cannibals and rapists had become the dominant power within the city, and obviously it became clear to many that the strong commanded the weak. With these factions leading the pit, the city would gain a reputation all over the east coast as being a brutal death-ridden place that should be avoided at all times, with many travellers speaking about the horrors that happened within.
In the year 2255, stories of the pit were spreading all over the East Coast, scaring off many scavengers and settlers. But for one group, these stories did not really scare them. With this, an expeditionary force of the Brotherhood of Steel, led by the then paladin Owen Lyons, arrived just outside the entrance of the pit, whilst they were trying to get to the capital wasteland. Lyons saw the city, and most likely saw the potential of owning a once fully functional industrial city, and without telling his troops exactly why, he launched an attack on the city. Entering the city from Mount Wash, Lyons and his group of soldiers took to taking out anyone who got in their way, and in one single night went on to slaughter half the city's population, with the soldiers only sparing those who surrendered immediately. This whole event was horrific to witness as many people were wiped off the face of the earth due to the brutality of Lyons' forces. Because of this, the whole operation would become known to many as the Scourge. To this date, it was unknown why Lyons wanted to conduct this operation or why he was adamant on killing anyone in their way. However, after this operation was done, the Brotherhood were able to take 21 healthy children from the area, including one Greg Bear, and put them immediately into initiate training. It was also said that during this operation, the Brotherhood recovered an important asset of some kind from the ruins of the city, but unfortunately it is unknown what exactly that was and what the Brotherhood have done with it to this date. But this operation, whilst it might have been seen to be a complete success, did have one fault. In their raid, they would go on to lose one member of their group, that being the initiate Ishmael Asher. But the Brotherhood still would not be bothered by this one lost casualty, and would continue on claiming that this operation was an overall success, albeit a harrowing one. The pit, however, was now at a turning point. After the horrific event of the Scourge, half of the population had been completely wiped out by the Brotherhood of Steel. The ones at the top who fought off the soldiers had all been wiped out. The trogs were still an issue, as were the wild ones. There was a huge power gap, and no one really wanted to take the place of their leader. However, under the wreckage of the pit lay one individual someone no one expected to be alive for one, or even seized this opportunity to gain power within this settlement. That survivor was Initiate Asher himself. The Brotherhood had never confirmed that Asher was actually dead. However, when getting to their base would claim that he had been killed in action by his squadmates, who did actually witness him being buried alive by a building that had collapsed beneath him. But luckily for Asher, he had been wearing his power armor, which had protected him from all of the falling rubble, saving his life in the process. After several days, Asher's body had been severely injured, and as he opened his eyes, noticed a woman who had also survived the scourge, attempting to take off his armor, believing him to just be a dead corpse. As he alerted her that he was still alive, Asher would question what she was doing, in which the lady replied that she and her family were staging raids into other parts of the pit to gather vital supplies. As Asher got back to walking, he would soon remember his brotherhood of steel intel that he had learned about before going into the pit, and soon realized that the building he had been trapped in was an operational steel mill a one-of-a-kind place that the Brotherhood had never truly seen before. It was clear to Asher that this was a vital building, and quickly decided that he was to get the locals still remaining within this area to help restore the city, utilizing this steel mill. The first people Asher would go on to recruit were the scavengers who had become some of his greatest admirers, believing him to be a god due to how he survived the building's fall, as well as his grand armor, which they have never really seen before. Luckily for this group of civilians who had begun the rebuilding process, the Brotherhood had swept up all of their important assets, but they had left behind a large amount of valuable salvage that they wrote off as damaged goods. Thanks to Asher, the rebuilding process went ahead and grew extremely fast as he ruled with an iron fist, forcing local raider gangs into his service as well as enslaving the weak to make sure the steel industry was fully restored. With the steel mill now fully working, the people of the pit were able to gain a ton of profit and immediately used it to recruit outsiders into his army as well as purchase healthier slaves from locations all over. But with the disease still rampant within the population, Asher learned of this and made sure that no one who was native of the pit was to reproduce, stating clearly why people shouldn't be doing it and also making it that the population of the pit was only increased by the purchasing of slaves and raiders from the outside world. But Asher knew that having a 
population made of predominantly slaves was only going to be a tricky situation, and so made sure to use smart propaganda to keep his subjects docile and to make sure there was no popular revolt against his rule. One example of this was Asher would go out and make frequent public appearances to the city's slaves, where he would make grand promises to them. Asher would state that if the slaves worked hard enough, they would be able to gain their freedom and join the ranks of his own army, with one of the main ways to be competing in fights to the death at a gladiatorial arena known as the Hole, which would not only be a place to show who was the strongest slave amongst one another, but also would be a source of entertainment for the rest of the slaves and mainly the raiders themselves. Whilst to many the idea of Asher's rule would be seen as absolutely horrific and purely evil, Asher himself saw this means of rule as being a necessary evil and only a temporary measure until a solution to the city's health crisis could be solved. Asher during this process was desperate to find that said cure, and for a long while this seemed like a futile effort. However, completely unexpectedly, a breakthrough came about as Asher's wife and chief scientist Sandra Kundanika gave birth to their daughter they would go on to name Marie. Whilst this of course was a great moment for the two, they would go on to worry that their child would have the same diseases that plagued many of the inhabitants of the pit. But to their amazement, Marie not only did not show any signs of TDC, she was also completely immune to that disease. Asher immediately saw his daughter as the way forward for the pit. Finally, they had a cure for their trog problem, and Marie was the sign of positive things to come. With this, Asher asked Sandra to monitor their daughter and study her to see if she could eventually find what was causing her immunity, in the hopes that someday soon they could rid the city of its trog problem and eventually turning the pit into a prosperous regional empire. During this same time, however, one man named Werner would find Asher's recruitment for his army, and would join his ranks earning a reputation almost immediately as one of the smarter members of the Pitt's Raider class. But power was on Werner's mind, and it didn't take long for him to want to take over from Asher's rule. By the year of 2277, Werner did just that, and started a coup to overthrow him. This immediately failed, however, as Asher took to enslaving Werner, and as an ultimate punishment, fitted him with a slave collar, something that was a real rarity within the Pitt with none of the other slaves having to wear one. This did not put off Werner at all, and in fact motivated him more to take over from Asher's rule. Here he continued with his planning, and would work closely together with another slave known as Medea, who would help lay the groundwork with him to make sure this time, this plan would go ahead with ease. Being the incredibly smart individual that Werner was, he would tamper with the slave collar and would be free from its control, and with that, would flee out to the capital wasteland, to start his second attempt of taking over the pit. Werner knew this plan needed an outsider. His reputation had become too well known. He needed someone who could stealth their way in and earn the respect of Asher so they could then steal the cure and have the one-up on Asher's leadership. Sending out a signal on a nearby radio broadcast, it would be the lone wanderer who would arrive just in time to help save Werner from the pit raiders, trying to silence him. Werner would be in their debt and told them of his plan, stating they needed to dress up as a slave to infiltrate the pit, meet up with Medea, and eventually earn the respect of Asher through fighting in the pit. This plan would go without a hitch as the lone wanderer would witness the treatment of the slaves, the isolated wild ones, as well as the terrifying whilst they desperately tried to salvage steel ingots within the steel yard. After defeating all the fierce foes within the hole, the Lone Wanderer was finally granted a meeting with Asher within the grand building known as Haven. It would be within this meeting where the Lone Wanderer would discover the true nature of this supposed cure Werner had been talking about. It was in fact a child, and not just anyone's child, but Asher's own child. It would be here where the Lone Wanderer would decide the ultimate fate of the city. Would they side with Werner in his attempt to overthrow Asher to rule the pit for himself, or would they side with Asher as he continued his rule and tried to gain a cure from his own daughter in a desperate attempt to make the pit a prosperous place to live and eventually use its influence to expand further out into the country? In the end, though, the 
pit seems to be a settlement that is stuck within a vicious cycle of violence. No matter who rules this city, there will always be someone trying to fight back and take from them. A cure does seem to be on the table thanks to Marie, but will it be enough for the pit to turn into a grand place to live, or will it always be ruled by an iron fist with raiders owning slaves to do their work for them, with the cure being just used as a way to seize power over the masses? Only time will really tell. But for now, this has been the story of the raider-run city known as the pit. And that is all for now. I want to say a huge thank you to you for watching this video, as well as my amazing patrons who allow me to make videos like this, including our small fishes, our big fishes, Christopher, AVP man, last persona user, and Arto Krem, our YouTube wise ones, Jambu, Fiery Italian, and Ico the Wolf, our sharks, Well Such Gaming, and Jason X117, our huge megalodons, Sinus and Jacob Garcia, and our absolutely legendary sawfish, Shadow SGT. If you also want to support this channel, you can find the link in the description below but if not please do leave a like check out my other law videos in the description below as well leave a subscribe if you haven't already as well as a nice comment to help with our lord and savior the algorithm but that is all for now thanks again and see you all in the next one cheers